best to address as many as I can at the end of the session. We'll start in about one minute officially. And it looks like it is 7 o'clock Mountain Time. Uh, most of you, I believe, are going to be in Central Time, so 8 a.m. Welcome. My name is Ranger Mike. I am a seasonal park ranger at Yellowstone National Park. I've been a park ranger for eight years now, or I'm starting my eighth year. I'm never sure how that really um, counts. But I want to welcome you to this discussion of biodiversity and in Yellowstone National Park. And it will really end up translating into our other public lands. But we want to um, kind of steal the motto of the Junior Ranger program that a lot of national parks have, and the Junior Ranger pro programs are different. But they really focus on learn, explore, and protect. And that's hopefully what we're going to learn a little bit today. We're going to learn and explore, and maybe you'll come to the conclusion of protection. Uh, Yellowstone National Park is the first national park, and we'll get to that in a second. And we do want to invite you to find your park. So there are now 417 units, I believe, in the National Park Service, and we have units in your own state. So if you come into Yellowstone National Park, through the north entrance, through Gardner, Montana, you'll see this Roosevelt Arch. Uh, and part of that is the, the words, um, for the benefit and enjoyment of people. And the next line is for future generations. And this is a really important aspect to the biodiversity of Yellowstone National Park uh, for the benefit and enjoyment of the people. So we have to talk a little bit about Yellowstone National Park, why it became a national park before we can really talk about the diversity. And again, here's your invitation to find your park. And um, when you think about Yellowstone National Park, Originated, had a nickname as Wonderland. And because of all the wonderful sights and some of the unusual things found in Yellowstone that are actually kind of rare, which will be leading to uh, some of the questions we're already getting. Yellowstone National Park, you know, from a park ranger's, from an educational educator's point of view, it's a living laboratory. And it's really a living laboratory because we didn't overdevelop Yellowstone. And that's really going to be a key point to the biodiversity. And of course, we consider Yellowstone the world's largest classroom. And we'll talk a little bit about that. In that classroom, we'll study geology, ecology, and human history. There's such a rich human history of Yellowstone National Park. But really, you can't talk about any one of these pillars of geology, ecology, and history without really touching on them all. Um, and of course, we have a couple educational opportunities for uh, educators, for students, uh, and groups. So we do Skype. We're doing we're doing this a different format for us, but we love learning new things, and so hopefully this goes well. And hopefully you'll turn in next Friday at 2 p.m. Mountain Zone, and we're going to focus a little bit more on the biodiversity of Yellowstone and the story of one key predator, the wolf. So when you hear Yellowstone, do you see do you think super volcano? Hopefully, um, I already had a couple questions. And about the volcano. So Yellowstone National Park is a super volcano, the largest active volcano in the world. Um, but when we're ever we're talking about the volcano, when we talk about those fumaroles, those mud pots, those hot springs, and those geysers, we're really talking about geology. Um, and then specifically uh, the volcano and the volcanic activity. It is still an active volcano. Uh, historically, it has erupted three times, and according to our scientists, it may erupt again uh, for a fourth time. And of course, there's nothing we can do to prevent uh, a major eruption. We can predict it. Hopefully, we'll know 
days, weeks, months, maybe even a year in advance. And so there is a huge magma chamber, and that magma chamber is the source of the energy of Yellowstone National Park, all the hot springs, and all the geysers. And without that, Yellowstone National Park probably wouldn't have been set aside to be the first national park. So we really owe it to the volcano. Everything comes back to the volcano. Um, of course, geysers, half of the world's geysers, so there's about 600 active geysers in the world, 300 are in Yellowstone National Park. This is a picture of the steam phase of Steamboat, the world's tallest geyser in Norris Geyser Basin. Now, it is not a predictable geyser. It did erupt uh, 2014, once in 2013, and then I think we have to go back to 2006 um, for the other eruption. But when it erupts, it's over 300 meters, uh, 300 feet. Um, so uh, really incredible. Of course, Old Faithful being the most famous uh, geyser in the geysers of Yellowstone National Park. And you can see it. We stream. There's a webcam. So on your own or after this, you can see, and maybe you'll be lucky enough to watch Old Faithful erupt. So besides those 300 geysers, we have thousands of hot springs. And unfortunately, our hot springs made the news last year. Um, a lot of our hot springs can be fatal for us if we fall into them. So there was a, um, an incident last year where somebody was walking in an area they shouldn't have been walking in, and they did fall into a hot spring. Um, and unfortunately, it was a fatal incident. Um, but thousands of hot springs. So if we add up all our geothermal features, we have about 10,000 geothermal features, all because of the volcano. And that's really the number one reason why Yellowstone National Park was set aside to be the first national park. Um, here would be a, kind of the outline of Yellowstone National Park, and you can kind of see the shaded area of the caldera or the rim of the volcano. So when you're in Old Faithful, uh, you're inside the volcano, and it's such a great distance, over 30 miles uh, to the east from Old Faithful, that you can't see the other side. So think about where you are if you went outside. Can you see your cousin waving to you 30 miles away? Um, that's how big our volcano is. It's huge. Um, that's why we use the term super volcano. And it's an amazing uh, place. But really, Yellowstone National Park was set aside March 1st, so we're just about to have a birthday, um, 1872. So when we start talking about where is Yellowstone, just to give you guys an idea, you know, Yellowstone National Park is in the Rocky Mountains. So we're in mountain zone, time zone. Uh, Yellowstone National Park is in three different states. Now, 1872, Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming were not even states yet. They decided that Yellowstone, for the benefit and the enjoyment of the people, was so important that we had to preserve and protect and create the first national park. Um, just some kind of interesting facts about Yellowstone National Park. And again, from this map, you can see that we're in the Rocky Mountains. Sorry about that. Um, and some interesting things that we're going to end up talking about is the lack of things. Uh, so when we talk about Yellowstone National Park, where we have 310 miles of paved roads, we definitely have roads, but we have over a thousand miles um, of hiking trails. You know, definitely it's an incredible place. Um, and again, you can kind of see our elevation, the highest point uh, being over 11,000 feet at sea level. I'm not sure what sea level is for you. Uh, a lot of the schools in today are in Illinois, so we're talking not thousands of feet, but hundreds of feet just above sea level or near sea level. Uh, so that is kind of interesting. Not to brag, but um, Delaware and Rhode Island could fit into the boundaries of Yellowstone National Park. Now, the largest national park is not Yellowstone. It is up in Alaska. Um, we're going to talk real quick about uh, my term, what I really like to talk about, and I call it the happy accident. Um, again, this is my opinion or my interpretation um, of what the greatness of that biodiversity is, is really from that designation of being a national park way back in 1872. So with that, and with 300 miles of road, but 1,000 miles of hiking trails, you know, or 2.2 million acres, what we have, and you can see this picture of a landscape, you can see for miles and miles, and I'm not sure what your resolution is, but you can barely see 
one stripe of a road in this photo. But everywhere else you look, you don't see roads, power lines, buildings. You know, as we start talking about that, it, it's up to you to decide if it's a good thing or a bad thing. You know, but there aren't that many buildings. There's not that many fences. There's not that many power lines. We have these things. You know, there is not a Starbucks on every corner. Uh, so the nearest Starbucks is about 90 miles away. And believe me, when I um, visit a big city and there's a Starbucks, I get my peppermint mocha with whip. Uh, but, you know, that's kind of the sacrifice um, or the incredible gift of not developing it. So Yellowstone National Park was really never logged. It was really never farmed. You know, there wasn't really mined. Um, so it is the best place and one of the largest places of an intact ecosystem where we as humans haven't developed uh, that huge area of land. Or sometimes I'll use the term overdeveloped. Um, so Yellowstone, it's not a designated wilderness place, but this is where we find the rich diversity with the lack of buildings, fences, roads, power lines. We really have an opportunity for nature to really be left alone. And as humans, sometimes that's hard for us to um, leave things alone. And we'll talk about that next week more when we talk about the wolves. Um, but 2.2 million acres and lots of Yellowstone looks like this. We have a lot of coniferous forest, those conifers, um, and sagebrush. We have a big glaciated valley here. But again, the lack, the lack of buildings, roads, fences, is really makes Yellowstone that largest classroom and a living laboratory to really study that ecology, which gives us that really rich biodiversity of Yellowstone National Park. Because, um, and we'll talk about the hunting real quick and why uh, Yellowstone is such an incredible place. So all these photos are really showing different aspects of Yellowstone National Park and how you can see a huge landscape without um, those human structures. And that's really, um, in my opinion, that happy accident. Um, it's not a designated wilderness area, but so much of Yellowstone, over 90% of Yellowstone's never been developed. Um, so if we take that percentage of 2.2 million acres, we can really see why it's such a great classroom. So the other thing, besides setting aside and not developing Yellowstone National Park um, to make it such a rich, diverse area, we also had to protect Yellowstone from ourselves. And one of the first laws that really helped Yellowstone, you know, get the foothold and continue to protect the biodiversity is with the Lacey Act. Now the Lacey Act uh, was written from Congressman Lacey to really protect the last wild herd in Yellowstone National Park. We were down to about 24 bison uh, and it was really the beginning of protection. So the Lacey Act, again, continues with that theme for the benefit and the enjoyment of people for future generations. Now again, in 1872 or with the Lacey Act in 1894, you know, this type of concept for future generations, it, it was a new concept. Um, and, you know, it could be maybe the first law to ever protect wildlife or protect wilderness. And there's just an incredible, you know, milestone in our history and saving some biodiversity. Uh, usually we talk about the Endangered Species Act. That wasn't until 1973. Um, so it's incredible that the biodiversity in Yellowstone and some of it, you know, because we needed a first national park, because of those geysers, because of those hot springs, and because we started realizing we had to make some rules and regulations to protect um, the park from ourselves, from the visitors. Uh, and that's really starting with the Lacey Act and some other things. Um, so let's, real quick, here's kind of the, we'll leave the slide up for a minute, you know, that intact ecosystem that we talk about Yellowstone National Park. You know, we'll talk mostly, um, when we talk to visitors, when we talk to students, mostly we talk about those 67 different species of mammal. Um, so, and we'll talk and briefly touch base on a lot of those. And certainly we're not going to talk about all 285 species of birds. Um, and then, you know, when it comes to the fish and everything else. So that lower photo, you know, not depending 
Not sure what your weather is where you guys are, but of course Yellowstone's still in the middle of a winter, and it's been a pretty mild winter. They've had a lot of snow, um, but we also, it's not uncommon to have snow in June. In fact, I don't think I've ever been in Yellowstone um, in June where it hasn't snowed some, you know, so besides being at the higher elevation, we're also in a very different climate. Um, and then I always have to bring up or lift up uh, vegetation, when we talk about biodiversity, so often we do talk about animals, but the biodiversity um, goes with all the organisms in Yellowstone National Park and how they interact and react to each other. Um, and of course, Yellowstone National Park, from a biodiversity point of view, it's kind of interesting when we start thinking about um, we're just dominated by the lodgepole pine. So we really do have one huge um, population of one species when it comes to the plants. And it's kind of fun to talk about 2.2 million acres of Yellowstone National Park. 80% of that is forest. 80% of that forest is one kind of tree. You know, so when we start talking about biodiversity, you know, it's also interesting to talk about the lack of biodiversity, um, with the lodgepole pine being such a dominant species when we're talking about plants. Um, of course, we have some plants that only grow here in Yellowstone National Park. Uh, and that's always incredible. And most of those plants, I'd have to double check if all those plants um, are all the geothermal related. Are they, you know, the ones that really grow near those hot springs? And with that chemistry and temperature, it really makes a very special uh, micro ecosystem. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that biodiversity and some of those um, wildlife that a lot of people come to see Yellowstone National Park. Now, we can't deny that the major attraction, Old Faithful, those geysers really bring forth, you know, a lot of our visitors. And our visitation is really in, um, taking a huge upswing. So from a couple years ago when we were at, you know, 3.2 3 million visitors, um, I just saw a post um, that we're at 4.25 million visitors for 2016. Um, so we can talk about that uh, at another point in time, you know, biodiversity and uh, our role in protecting that. And over-visitation is something to talk about or to think about. Um, what does it mean when we have 4 million visitors to all these animals? Um, so again, those 67 mammals, which are usually the main focus, but talking about the birds, uh, the insects, and everything else, it's just an amazing place. And it's really amazing because we set it aside and we didn't develop it way back in 1872. So there's just so many happy accidents is the term I like to use when I'm just um, looking at the history and everything else um, that gives us this really rich biodiversity is really kind of the creation of the first national park. And someone did ask about, you know, is it the first national park in our nation? Is it the first one in the world? Uh, it's definitely the first national park in the nation. So there were some state parks that existed in other parks but the first national park uh, in the United States is uh, Yellowstone National Park. And the question was about the world. And there's some um, debate and a few other things, so we'll have to research a little bit for that really uh, correct answer. Um, but Yellowstone's really become um, you know, the cornerstone, the example, and, and sometimes the cheerleader for national parks worldwide. And then that term wilderness, again, we're not designated wilderness, that's a different designation. Um, but the fact that you can get 15 miles away from the nearest road, from the nearest human-made structure in Yellowstone National Park, it's definitely a wild place. And it's definitely a place where you can see um, the lack of human development and then the role, the plants and the animals and the geology, the landscape really has and how it's all connected. So again, going back to the Lacey Act, you know, the Lacey Act really helped us to start protect those last 24 bison in the 1890s. And it also helped us to really realize that we need to protect these wild animals. They're just not, you know, in that time frame, we're just expanding west as a nation. Um, and, you know, you can read a little bit more about the bison history um, with that western expansion. So today, we don't have 24 bison. Um, so the Lacey Act, you know, has continued to grow. You can see some of our paved roads. You can see 
um, some of the cars in the size of a bison, you know, the largest land mammal here in North America, um, and a full grown male uh, can be over 2,000 pounds. So this is actually a female uh, standing in the road. And again, um, I always like to point out really the lack, um, the lack of fences. Yellowstone National Park's not a zoo. We don't feed the animals. We really study the animals, and that's an important aspect. We don't put bison in the back of our car. Um, read, read about it. Uh, someone did that. Um, so it's just an amazing opportunity to see wildlife, to really see that biodiversity um, up close and personal. But this is where I need to kind of remind you guys not to get too close to any of our wild animals. When we're studying the biodiversity, we need to keep a safe distance. That's to protect the wild animals, and it's to protect ourselves. So we do ask that you stay 25 yards um, from most of our uh, mammals. And hopefully you guys all know what selfies are. People have been injured um, by taking selfies with bison. Again, when you get next to a 2,000-pound wild animal, and sometimes we forget they're wild animals, to take that selfie, take that little photo uh, with the bison, you know, they got injured. And what I think is great um, or important, maybe it's not great. It's not great that anyone got hurt. But it's great that we have, you know, these park rules and regulations. So these people, unfortunately, that were hurt by the bison for getting too close, you know, they had to pay the doctor bill. And then they were also charged with that Lacey Act. That law from the 1890s is still being used today. Um, so it's really important uh, that we respect our wildlife. If you come to study the biodiversity, we also have to respect it and tread lightly. Um, even as scientists, even when we're studying the ecosystem, we want to practice all those principles of leave no trace. And very commonly, we say, take photos and leave footprints. And that's your impact on the ecosystem. And it'd be great if everyone did that. Um, so don't approach the wildlife. And um, the wildlife has the right of way. So she is holding up traffic. And she can stay in the middle of the road as long as she wants. We don't necessarily push them out. Um, and we do have people that have special training. And we really try to. But we don't hurt them like animals as much as possible. Um, so they're left wild to study. Uh, the current population is somewhere around 5,000 bison today. So it's kind of interesting. Again, with Western expansion from that history tie, remember geology, ecology, history, it's almost impossible to talk about one without talking about all three. We've already talked about the Lacey Act, but when we go back before uh, Yellowstone National Park was designated a national park, people out east were hearing stories from fur trappers they were trapping beavers. Um, so the first European descent people in the Yellowstone came back talking about um, the biodiversity, the amount of animals and plants, but also the hot springs and the geysers. And that really ended up sparking the interest and you know, the creation of the first national park. Uh, and they were trapping beavers. Uh, so it's interesting. And next week, we'll talk a little bit about some connections with the beavers and the wolves that um, isn't a direct connection, but it's still amazing when it comes to that biodiversity and how every plant and animal um, in that ecosystem depends and relies on um, each other. That relationship's really strong. Of course, Yellowstone National Park is famous for its bears. Uh, if your grandparents or great grandparents came to Yellowstone National Park years and years ago, um, oh, so I'm ahead of myself when it comes to the slides. Uh, so we'll go real quick. We have two species of bear, black bear and grizzly bear. Um, as I assume, all your students, all you guys, don't have the same hair color. Um, I just realized I'm not wearing my ranger hat. Um, so uh, black bears are black bears, no matter what color they are. Uh, so sometimes we can do a quick analysis um, and a lesson on you know, wildlife identification, and then we'll realize that not every black bear is black in color. So she, um, this is a sow and two cubs. You can definitely see the black bear cubs. Um, this is not a grizzly bear raising uh, black bear cubs. That may happen in Disney and other areas. That does not happen in Yellowstone. Um, so actually, about a third of our black bears are not black in color. Um, so as we study that, we can really talk about bear identification and the importance of 
the bear identification. Of course, when they see a brown black bear, they think they're seeing the grizzly bear. Uh, grizzly bear is one of the endangered species in Yellowstone National Park. Um, and it's kind of a current event. So I encourage you guys to really read up on um, the Endangered Species Act, uh, what's going on in Washington, D.C., but what's also what's happening at the state level. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that next week when it comes to the wolf. Um, but some states are trying to push to delist the grizzly bear. Um, there's a lot of information out there. And just like on in the internet, there's a lot of misinformation out there. So it's really your job to be a detective and to really study up, you know, is removing uh, the grizzly bear from the endangered species list in Montana or Wyoming or Idaho. Is that a good idea? Is it a good thing? Is it time? Is it overdue? Or do they still need protection? Um, that's really uh, your job to find out and research those answers, not for me to give them to you. Um, so we do have a quick question about the black bear and the grizzly bear and identification, and we can go into that. So the classic uh, black bear, uh, we have that um, dominant ear profile, and that really helps me. Um, so I really look at the ears. Um, you can look at the shape of the face, um, but most often we talk about the rump. So the rump, the butt um, of the black bear is going to be the highest thing when they're not standing up on their back leg. Um, when we look at a grizzly bear, the highest part um, of their like silhouette is going to be what we call their hump, right above their top. That's a muscle mass, um, and it really kind of goes to you know those special adaptations, those things that help those organisms survive. Grizzly bears um, are much more adapted for digging, um, and so they have a huge muscle mass to help them dig. Um, you know, digging for roots, digging for animals. Uh, so we talk about the rump and the hump. We talk about, I usually um, talk about the shape of the face um, and those dominant ears, that those rounded ears that you can see in a black bear. But we don't use color. Um, so it is amazing, you know, with about a third of the black bears um, not being black. And if we kind of look at the paws, especially the mom in the back here, you know, a grizzly bear can be like a dark, um, melt chocolate brown. Uh, so, you know, in the right light, they could even appear to be black, you know, so they can be dark, darker brown. And we definitely had a black bear in the Norris area, um, uh, almost blonde, you know, really, really light brown. Um, so it's, uh, you really talk about the hump and the rump. Sometimes you talk about the ears. We can talk about the claws, those adaptations. Black bears are especially curved. Uh, you know, that biodiversity for climbing and the grizzly bear, bear's claws are, you know, more outreach, definitely adapted for digging. Uh, usually as a ranger, we say if you're identifying a bear by its claws, you're too close. Now, for most of our animals, we do talk about 25 yards, you know, being a safe distance to study and take photos and whatnot. When it comes to our major predators, you know, bears included, we ask you to be 100 yards or a whole soccer field away. Um, from those major predators. And again, it's to protect you, but it's to protect those wild animals. Um, so we like to study afar. Um, so telephone lenses are a big thing in Yellowstone National Park. Um, so uh, someone's asking about, you know, if there's a trend and whatever, uh, when it comes to um, the bears, as far as I know, there's not really been a study um, about any trends about them getting lighter or darker. Um, I know when it comes to pica, you know, sometimes we'll see in darker rock areas, darker pica, which is amazing. Um, and then when it comes to the gray wolf, um, just like not all black bears are black. Um, and I don't know if I have that loaded up. Um, of course, um, this is where I was starting to go. You know, if your parents or grandparents uh, came to Yellowstone, we definitely treated our wildlife historically really radically different. Um, this is not good science. Um, it's part of our history. Um, so we can't deny that it happened, um, but we definitely do not feed the bears. We kind of closed our dumps in 1969 and quit that policy of feeding bears. So prior to 1969, maybe when your grandparents or great-grandparents, maybe if they were lucky enough to come to Yellowstone, it was not illegal um, to feed a bear or go to a bear feeding and to see a park ranger um, hanging out and apparently eating with bears. Um, 
but we kind of stopped that practice in 1969. Um, so I always like to say Woodstock, man on the moon, Yellowstone quit feeding the bears, um, all 1969. Um, so, uh, so a question when it came to grizzly bears and black bears, you know, do they fight? I kind of like, um, I always like to ask people, you know, do you ever have a really good fight with your cousin? We can kind of think about black bears and grizzly bears, both being of the Ursus, the bear family. Um, they, they do not get along. So they're like fighting cousins. So the grizzly bear is much larger, typically more aggressive than a black bear. Um, and they will, grizzly bears will kill black bears. And that's more of um, a territorial thing. They're not really killing them as much as a food source. So it's not like the grizzly bears are hunting down the black bears for food, um, but they're going to defend and fight their t and defend their territory. They will chase off, and if they catch a black bear, a grizzly bear will kill um, a black bear. So again, this is something we do not want you to do. Do not feed. We don't want that habituation in any of our animals, no matter how large or small. You know, it is part of our history, but we need to learn from our mistakes um, and do better science and do better uh, preservation for future generations. Again, it goes back to the original documents. Um, and some of those other animals and how they're related. Uh, so we have the bison and elk, you know, are, are major herbivores in the park and definitely studied and enjoyed and protected in the park. So again, with the Lacey Act, you know, now there is no hunting in Yellowstone National Park. We'll use the Lacey Act in other parks. Um, so uh, no hunting. So that really allows, you know, that biodiversity and for nature to really kind of run its course um, with the ebb and flows of the populations. We definitely study the elk populations um, and how they're connected to um, other populations. Of course, when we talk about the elk population, um, it's impossible not to talk about the wolf population. Um, if you guys were a pack of wolves, your favorite meal is not pizza. Your favorite meal would be elk in Yellowstone National Park. You know, that's the number one food source. Uh, definitely, we see wolf packs hunting other animals, but really, uh, there is a strong correlation. You know, as the elk population goes up, it gives the chance for the wolf population to go up. Um, if there's a huge decline in the elk population, it's definitely going to have a direct correlation, a direct effect on the wolf population. Um, we'll see that with any species, you know, when it comes to uh, the carrying capacity. How many wolves on the landscape is good? Well, that's going to be tied to how many elk or how many other food sources are available. And they're all directly connected in a very, very strong way. Um, and again, some of the biodiversity that I love about Yellowstone, when we start talking about the canines. Now, I know my video is um, kind of smaller. Um, but when we're talking about the canines, we're talking about the canine family, which is named after this tooth right here. So hopefully you guys can, um, I'm not being eaten by a dinosaur. This would be a gray wolf, Canis lupus, um, and they're named for the canines. But I do have to remind you, you know, when you go to the dentist, your dentist will talk about your canines, your incisors, your premolars, and your molars. Now, if you have a cat at home, a feline, um, your feline still has canines, but the canine family um, is something a lot of people are interested in that really will be the focus of our next one. Um, next week. But when it comes to Ursus, the bear family, obviously they still have canines, um, but this would be um, a grizzly bear. Um, so canines, incisors, premolars, but much more molars. Uh, so it is always interesting to be able to study um, the skulls and the teeth and learn about it. But the canine family, we're talking about the dogs. Um, so the wolves are the top dog. And Yellowstone did go to history without any wolves in Yellowstone National Park, about 70 years without wolves. Uh, and that had effect on the ecosystem, had effect on the elk population, it had effect on a lot of different things. Um, so uh, but then coyotes. So this is a photo of two coyotes. So just like grizzly bears and black bears really get misidentified, um, you know, when it comes to the gray wolf. Um, and again, kind of like a distant cousin, um, the coyote, much smaller, so three times smaller a wolf on average, coyotes. And again, um, the ears tell all. Um, so really, the coyotes have that much larger 
uh, ear to body ratio. Uh, so I really will look at ears with my bears and with my dogs, uh, the canines, to really do a quick identification. Um, and I don't have those slides loaded. And of course, the smallest canine, and we could really, you know, split hairs. Um, I have a supervisor, he's like, either you're a lumper or a splitter. Uh, so talking about, you know, does the fox really belong in the canine family or not? So most of the time when we talk about it, we do consider the fox um, a canine. Uh, they are a little bit different. They're just an incredible animal. Um, but all three dogs are um, specially adapted to live. And in Yellowstone, all three are protected within the boundaries. Now, someone's asking about, um, you know, do they migrate? And, you know, the hunters um, definitely will migrate, but they're not migrating um, because of the winter or to get um, to a lower elevation. They're just following their food source, you know, and that's part of the connection. We'll zip back to, you know, when the L, you know, when in the northern herd, when they go north for the winter to a lower elevation, definitely the wolves will follow um, their prey, um, their dinner. Um, so when other animals migrate, those predators are kind of forced to migrate kind of with them. And again, that's just showing how everything is connected and why um, these wild open places, this 2.2 million acres, serves an, an incredible role. Now, they do migrate out of the park. Um, again, all these photos, you're not seeing any fences. Um, there's not a fence around Yellowstone National Park. So these animals um, don't have to go through the gates or the pay the entrance fees. Um, they roam, and they're going to follow their, their historic migrant patterns. So when the elk leave, you know, typically the wolves are going to follow to some extent. And, you know, the scavengers, uh, the hunters, the coyotes um, also will kind of potentially do that. Of course, the coyotes, number one food source, are going to be small mammals, so the mice and this and that. Um, they're incredible to watch when they're hunting. And we do see two coyotes here. You know, coyotes can. It doesn't matter if you say coyote or coyote. Um, you know, those coyotes can obviously um, be in smaller groups, but the wolves are the famous pack animal. Um, they're the famous one working together. They have that teamwork, you know, hunting together, using uh, each other's strengths um, to really be more successful in the hunt. We definitely will see grouping of coyotes, um, but typically much smaller, less organized, and not really that strong. Uh, communication, strong bond, that strong sense of teamwork. Um, so it's pretty incredible. And of course, um, the fox. So kind of like those fighting cousins, wolves will chase off and kill coyotes. Again, it's more about territory and about defending their pups and everything else. It's really not, wolves really aren't hunting coyotes as a food source. Um, so it's really more about uh, defending their territory. And of course, we did talk real briefly, you know, about the pica. Um, there has been some studies, I haven't really read any concluding things, that in the darker rock, so pica, um, a legomore, kind of like a rabbit. Um, so again, a very, very distant coven um, to those hares. Um, you know, the darker scree fields, they're going to live in those alpine areas in the scree field. Um, there is kind of a correlation. And I'd like to um, see where that study is and see if they come to a conclusion. Um, you know, do, you know, the darker scree fields, we kind of see some of the darker pica. Now, we, um, our hypothesis is just the lighter ones show up more, and then they're hunted uh, by weasels, by the coyotes, by foxes, by hawks. Um, so, uh, we'll uh, start to make sure I've entertained a lot of the questions. And if you have another question, um, definitely want to use the last um kind of 20 minutes to see where this discussion really kind of goes. Uh, so uh, someone's asking about earthquakes. And again, uh, so the earthquakes do uh, happen in Yellowstone. We have over, on average, over 1,000 per year. That's normal. Um, so if you quick do um, a calculation of how many that is per day, and that would be normal. Uh, so usually when we talk about that next eruption, um, that's where uh, earthquakes play a large role. Uh, and then historically, we see that earthquakes have really uh, changed some things in Yellowstone. Uh, there was a huge earthquake in 1959, um, actually outside of Yellowstone, but definitely affected our roads and a few other things. 
Um, again, I'm going to refer to the great grandparents or grandparents that they came to see Old Faithful. Um, Old Faithful got its name in the 1870s um, for being faithful, for resting about every hour, um, and being a predictable geyser over 100 feet. Now, that's not the timing we use today. There was a series of earthquakes in the 1980s uh, that kind of changed the timing of Old Faithful. And as far as I know, it's those earthquakes in the early 1980s uh, that we still use that current timing. Uh, um, so another earthquake could once again change the timing of Old Faithful. On average, it's about every 89 minutes, so not quite every 90 minutes um, for the average. Uh, but that's a uh, rural earthquakes are important. And with a 1,000 per year, um, you never know what's going to happen. But if there was going to be a major eruption, we would see an increase of frequency and magnitude of our earthquakes. And that would be one of the major signs knowing something's happening with that magma chamber underneath Yellowstone National Park. Remember that magma chamber is over 30 miles across. It's huge. Um, so uh, earthquakes play an important role. So the real question was, you know, would earthquakes um, affect the animals? You know, as earthquakes will change the landscape, as earthquakes may change some of the dynamics of our geothermal fe features, that definitely has an effect on the animals. Um, and there's, um, you know, you can read or hear about people talking about like animals can sense an earthquake before we can. Um, the last thing I read about that uh, was that there really isn't any type of scientific evidence knowing um, that the animals can predict, um, at least not that well or that accurately, um, or at least they're not telling us. We can't really observe that uh, phenomenon um, from a scientific point of view. Uh, it is interesting. Uh, that sometimes they kind of know, but you know the biggest effect earthquakes would have on animals would be as an earthquake uh, causes a landslide or changes uh, the landscape, and that might be the hunting ground or the migrant patterns or something like that to an animal. Uh, so I would say humans are probably deeper affected by earthquakes than animals. Now that's just my opinion. Uh, so we'll see. Um, where we end up and if who else has questions. Now, it is interesting that the pika does have an important role. Uh, we call it an indicator species. So this small uh, rodent uh, uh, can't regulate its heat very well. So as we start seeing our winters not being as long, our winters not being as cold, our summers being a little drier and a little bit longer and a little bit warmer, um, this is going to have a direct effect on the pika, who can't regulate their heat. Um, so we are doing some scientific surveys. Uh, we're using citizen science. We're using students like you that come to Yellowstone uh, to kind of map using GPSs, using um, some simple observational forms to really, really trying to map where our pika are and are they moving. Um, and some other studies in Colorado, they have seen pika go in higher elevation. Um, in Colorado, you have maybe a better option to go in higher elevation. Um, in Colorado, you have maybe a better opportunity. You know, they have, you know, over 50 mountains, over 14,000 feet, um, the 14ers. Uh, so in Yellowstone, our highest mountain, Eagle uh, Peak, is at 11,000. So our mountains aren't quite as big or as high. So moving up to cool off. Uh, isn't always an option. And of course, they can't move up too high if there's not a food source for them. Uh, so it is interesting that the pika, when it comes to um, climate change and trying to really figure out what's going on, um, a great indicator species. Um, so this cute little animal um, is really much more um, so, um, under the influence of those warming trends. You and I, we sweat, we can take off layers. You know, the pika doesn't have that option. Um, so going up higher in elevation is one option that they've observed in other areas. And we're really trying to get a baseline of that population with GPS waypoints um, and figuring out if something like that is happening here in Yellowstone National Park. Um, so um, a great question uh, when it comes to um, some of the organisms that we really didn't talk about with the biodiversity, you know, we really briefly talked about plants. Um, we spent most of our time talking about those mammals. Uh, but the microorganisms living in uh, those hot springs. So um, we'll see 
Um, I wonder where my closest uh, hot spring slide would be. It might be going the other way. Um, so oh, there's a black wolf. Um, I went the wrong way. Um, so when it comes to the hot springs, I'm just kind of zipping through, try to find a slide if I can. I should have gone forward. Or so those geysers. So when we start seeing color, so here's a fumarole, those steam vents. Um, but when you see those oranges, uh, those reds, the greens, <clears throat> basically what's not white, black, or gray in our geothermal areas. Now, it could be a mineral deposit. Um, so that is a possibility. But most of the time, especially if it's wet, it's going to be living organisms. So we definitely have students. We have college students. We work with the University of Montana and Montana State. Um, we've even worked with NASA. I'm um, coming in looking at these thermophiles, these extremophiles that are living in that ecosystem. Uh, real briefly, I talked about a human that died in a hot spring. Um, so that's why we call them extremophiles. They're living in a hostile environment, according to us humans. Um, so those microbes, um, they are thriving. Some of these archaea and some of these other uh, microorganisms that live um, and and low pH, some of them are acidic, some will be a high pH, be alkaline or basic, um, and extreme temperature, some close to the boiling temperature, you know, close to that 212 um, degrees Fahrenheit um, or 100 degrees Celsius, that boiling temperature water. We have life forms just on the edge of that temperature range, and it's amazing. Um, and when it comes to um, some of those organisms have been studied and some of them actually have changed the world, uh, which is incredible when we start talking about one of those uh, extremophiles, one of those thermophiles, Thermus aquatus, uh, was studied in the 60s, isolated, and they're like, oh, this is great. They put it to a practical use. Um, this thermophile, um, this organism living in the hot springs in Yellowstone, it has been found in other uh, geothermal areas outside of Yellowstone, but we use Thermus aquatus today for rapid DNA fingerprinting. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so it ends up being kind of a catalyst you know, for that DNA fingerprinting. Um, and the only reason we have rapid DNA fingerprinting is because of the, one of those microorganisms in Yellowstone National Park. Um, so it is incredible. And what I think is incredible um, is we know very little um, about these microorganisms or how many they are and what they really are. Some of them. Um, are living without oxygen, and that's how they survive. Um, closely related, and maybe one of the first forms on our planet before we had an oxygen um, atmosphere, these organisms could have been living in some hot springs and some volcanic areas. Um, <clears throat> in fact, might be responsible partially for um, our oxygen in our atmosphere. Um, so some of them don't use photosynthesis. They don't use sunlight in any way. They don't use oxygen. And they're alive and thriving in these hot springs. Um, so definitely it's a place of continued study. Um, and when it comes to the biodiversity, this is um, depending where you read it, you know, we only know, you know, four to eight percent of these thermophiles. That leaves, you know, 96 and 92 percent still to be discovered. Um, and maybe uh, one of you guys listening here today um, are gonna, you know, discover some new thermophiles and to see if they have any practical use uh, like Thermos Aquatus has um, with rapid DNA fingerprinting. Uh, so things are radically different in our world because of that one organism discovered and isolated and studied here in Yellowstone National Park. And that's incredible. So we're going to you know, spend the last 12 minutes. If anyone else has any questions, I'm going to um, try to scroll through and see how many questions I missed. Um, I thought I was. Um, talking about, so someone did ask, um, and I'll try to get us back to where I thought we'd be on our PowerPoint, so excuse the rapid sneak peek at some of the stuff we'll talk about next week. Um, so, um, you know, the pika, really interesting. We're doing some citizen science. Um, and again, we didn't really talk that much about the birds, you know, those 285 species of birds. And of course, most you know, a large number of the birds will migrate, and so we'll start seeing them. It's great to always see the mountain bluebird. Um, I grew up in the Midwest, so when we saw the robin, we knew it was springtime. Well, out in Yellowstone National Park, uh, when we see the mountain bluebird, 
you know, we know spring's right around the corner. It's kind of our tall tale sign um, that things winter is finally going to be over. Uh, of course, this is a picture of a great horned owl. Um, so uh, just, again, just kind of a nod to those animals that we didn't get a chance to talk about. But somebody asked about um, what restrictions do you have for camping at Yellowstone National Park? Um, I love talking about this because I like to camp. Um, I love to camp. Um, and backpack. So we have like 301 backcountry sites in Yellowstone National Park. We have over 2,000 front country or, you know, like state park or car camping sites, you know, for your trail or your RV or tent camping. Uh, so uh, we do ask that you be what we call bear aware. So remember that photo where we were feeding bears? We don't do that. That's to protect the bears. That's to protect you. And it's to protect the next visitor. Um, that's probably the most important part. Uh, besides protecting the bear, um, is protecting the next visitor. Uh, so if any wild animal gets habituated, gets fit food, associates human as a food source, um, sometimes it can be kind of cute for you to feed an animal, but then the next time that animal comes to a human, it's going to want to be fed. Um, so we see chipmunks kind of mugging visitors because they've been fed by other visitors, and they, they want those Doritos. They want those Cheetos. Um, they'll crawl up. Um, potentially on your leg or on your foot or get really, really close. And, you know, they can have parasites, they can have fleas, they can carry disease. It's really not good for us to interact with our animals. So when it comes to restrictions um, in our camping, um, we have to be bear aware. And that's probably the biggest uh, change from camping in other parts of the United States. You know, we do have bears, we coexist, um, and it's the right thing to do. Um, so all your food has to be put away, and no food in tents. Um, so uh, food has to be stored in what we call bear boxes, or food storage containers, or they um, have to be in your car. So, or if you're in the back country, they'll be hung in a tree from a bear pole, um, or from trees uh, being nine feet above the ground. So again, you know, when it comes to restrictions, uh, staying on the trail, especially in the geothermal areas. Um, in the backcountry, when it comes to camping, uh, we have designated backcountry sites. Other parks have camping areas. Um, so we have actual designated height sites. So you're at, you know, 1A1, and this other group of six is going to be at 1A2. Um, and then 2R2, you know, up at Ribbon Lake, you know. So um, 301, I have only probably been in maybe 20 of the 301 backcountry sites. So lots more for me to explore and learn and to continually protect. Um, so uh, the, the restrictions really are mostly about the bears. Um, you know, reservations, again, with 4 million visitors, um, that is part of uh, the challenge. Uh, but really, when it comes to getting out in the backcountry to really see that biodiversity, um, to see those plants and those animals in the landscape and how they're all interacted, uh, backpacking is one of the most incredible ways. Bear attacks are extremely rare. Um, so with a little training, uh, you do have to watch a video on uh, the wilderness, and part of that is bear, being bear aware. Um, I've never had a major incident with any of the bears in the backcountry. Um, so, so and someone's asking about the reptiles uh, in Yellowstone National Park. So we definitely, um, again, when we come to that um, list, we do have some reptiles in Yellowstone National Park. Um, but, you know, with snow, honestly, we can have snow 12 months out of the year when it comes to those cold-blooded animals. No turtles uh, in Yellowstone National Park. Uh, it is interesting, but we definitely have one lizard, a couple snakes. Um, but all of them are going to have to be able to hibernate. Um, we have a few toads and frogs, one salamander. Um, but I really think... You know, we're at a higher elevation. We're at about average about 7,000 feet above sea level. And with our long extended winter, uh, cold-blooded animals have uh, some challenges in Yellowstone National Park. So we definitely have some reptiles, um, some snakes. Uh, we have one venomous snake, and the rest of them are really going to be constrictors. Um, gardener snake, uh, bull snake. Bull snake is one of my favorites because they eat mice, and the more mice they eat, same with the owl that you guys see here. The more mice owls eat um, or coyotes eat or foxes eat, the less mice are trying to get into my housing, I always like to say. Um, so 
we definitely have a couple um, of those cold-blooded animals, but really, you know, with our ecosystem, they're kind of rare. And I really think it has to do with that large, you know, our large winters. So that's a great question. Um, so uh, anyone else has any questions, it'd be great. We have about five minutes left. Um, hopefully I didn't go too short with the presentation. Um, but some definitely, and um, when it comes to some of those cold-blooded animals, um, it is interesting when we start talking about it. Um, so there was just recently, within the last couple years, so I'll say in the last three years, a new species for Yellowstone National Park. So not a new species in the world. Um, so I can't remember if it was a toad or a frog um, that was discovered in Yellowstone. So it would be common to like Montana, but it was never really discovered in Yellowstone National Park. So what um, my point is, you know, we're still learning um, and discovering things about the animals and really what animals live in Yellowstone. Um, what animals are in Yellowstone. So when it comes to um, those amphibians, you know, we had to change our number from like four to five in the last two, three, three years um, because a new frog or toad, I forget, um, was recently discovered to live in Yellowstone. So it was known to live in Montana. So that is pretty amazing that we do have um, changes, um, new uh, features. And again, you know, if you would ask a park ranger 20 years ago about raccoons, um, <clears throat> raccoons really weren't known to be in Yellowstone National Park. Now we do see um, raccoons in the park, and we really think there's a uh, part of that is because of our winters not being as harsh, not as long, um, and smaller snowpacks. So we do see raccoons, but I'm told, you know. 20, 30 years ago, raccoons were never seen in the park, you know, so um, when it comes to that, um, so I do want to thank everyone for participating. We still have a few more questions. We do want to, um, you know, again, talk real briefly. Uh, if you enjoyed this thing, want to get deeper onto one of these subjects, we do have an active Skype program, and we're going to be back here working um, with you guys um again at 2 p.m mountain time on february 24th and we're really going to talk more about you know the role of the wolf you know at, as the wolves were removed by humans um in the early 1900s uh so we had no wolves for about 70 years uh, 1995 we reintroduced the wolf um so we'll be really specifically kind of going in taking that general biodiversity we're going to really kind of focus on you know the wolf reintroduction and, you know, the roles it had, you know, the, some, some of that cor correlation with beavers. You know, I mentioned that a little bit before, um, how wolves and beavers in those populations um, had um, an impact on each other, which is amazing. Uh, so, again, we want to encourage you guys, thank you guys, and see if you guys have any other questions um, when it comes to uh, anything in Yellowstone National Park. I think I missed a few. Um, question, what is the coolest experience or story uh, working in Yellowstone National Park? Being a seasonal ranger for eight years, I have too many. Um, but I would say one thing I really love as part of my job is leading ranger-led hikes. Uh, so if your school, if your class comes to Yellowstone National Park, one of my favorite things is to lead those hikes. And I'm always amazed at what we discover, um, what we see, what I discover, what I see for the first time or with new eyes. Um, so the wonder and awe and the great questions when it comes to Yellowstone National Park. Um, I've seen uh, so many incredible animal encounters. Um, uh, you know, the geothermal area is just amazing. I got to see um, some major eruptions. I did see the steam phase of Steamboat. Um, and, you know, I work, so if you guys, I'm not sure of our school level, but if you guys are interested in working in Yellowstone National Park, Yellowstone National Park, uh, real quick, does have a residential student employment program. Uh, it's called the Yellowstone Youth Conservation Corps. We commonly call it YCC. So if you Google that, um, I think there's even a link on my bio. 
Uh, if you're 15 to 18 years old, uh, potentially you could live and work in Yellowstone National Park for a month. Um, you get paid uh, and you work in Yellowstone National Park and you would be able to maybe uh, put together a PowerPoint just like that using your own photos. Um, so a quick plug for our next class next week. Um, again, taking that theme of biodiversity to the next level and really focusing on what happens to the ecosystem when you remove a species and what happens when you are able to uh, put that species back um, and some of the benefits of the entire ecosystem when it comes to that. Again, thank you very much. Um, and I uh, just wanted to see if anyone else has any other questions. If not, I just want to encourage you guys, again, to learn, explore, and protect. Um, again, this coyote, middle of the road, it's our job to learn about the coyote's habitat, um, its habits, um, to explore the possibilities, but also protect our wild animals. And our wild animals need to stay wild. Um, even if they're in the middle of the road, um, it's our job um, to always learn, explore, and protect. Um, so that happens um, at your school, on your state parks, and with our national parks. Again, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And we'll see you guys later. Um, I appreciate any feedback or any questions. I'll still be on for a while. Thank you.